Right, hello everyone and welcome to our 14th online workshop on transplantation experiences. I'm Maura Zeely smith a patient and volunteer, and I'm hosting today's workshop as Patrick Walker, one of our regular patient moderators for these online workshops, received the gift of a kidney transplant over Christmas. We wish him all the best for a speedy recovery. I know he can't wait to be well enough to host another workshop soon. I'm delighted to welcome with me Adam Jardine, another Allport patient who I met at the Siena conference in 2019. Adam is based in Washington DC in the US. Adam recently started a new job in the office of one of the US congressmen. Adam, what sort of things do you do for the congressman? Thanks for the intro, Aura. Uh, it's great to see you and so many of the familiar and friendly faces in uh, our ever-growing community. Uh, as, as you mentioned, uh, I'm an Alport Center patient, uh, diagnosed uh, like so many other people in mid-teenage years after experiencing hearing loss. I really just had a passion for trying to help out similars and for others in similar position. Uh, so I, I work within Congress uh, to help improve uh, our healthcare policies uh, for kidney patients, uh, among some of the other things I do. Uh, for example, uh, we're trying to help increase funding for living organ donors, so that way their expenses can be reimbursed to, to help increase uh, living organ donor re uh, services to help cut down on the ever-growing amount of uh, our growing wait list. Uh, but with that said, I'm incredibly interested uh, and excited to hear about from all of our great panelists, uh, the patients and doctors. Uh, so with that said, uh, I'll turn it back over to you, Aura. Great, thank you. Um, so moving on to our topic for today, transplantation experiences. Firstly, we're going to show you a very short video that a group of young Allport patients wrote and produced. Thank you to Alfie Bailey and Jamie Walker for the narration, Eleanor Beer for the illustrations, and to Rachel Lennon and Amrit Kaur for the answering the questions. A question that plays on the minds of all port patients is if or when will the kidney need a transplant? The routine tests that you will have throughout your lifetime measure the creatinine levels and protein in the urine all help to determine your kidney function. Once kidney function drops below about 30%, it would then be time to start working up towards a kidney transplant. This process varies in length from several months to several years. There are many factors that can affect this, including how well a person is living with reduced kidney function, donor availability, and whether the patient is well enough to undergo the transplant procedure. Once a donor has been identified and the patient is ready for transplant, there are a number of things that must be done beforehand. The patient needs all immunizations to be up to date, including live vaccines, which cannot be given after a kidney transplant. The patient has a full MOT to check they are otherwise healthy and well, with no infections or extremes of blood pressure. The transplant process itself is typically 7 to 10 days from going into the hospital to coming out with a new kidney. Surgery takes approximately 6 hours. The plumbing of the new kidney takes a mere 40 minutes. Once a correct place for the new kidney has been found, blood vessels are clamped to stop blood flow. The kidney is fitted and the blood vessels are connected. And then once unclamped, the new kidney fills with blood and begins to work straight away. A catheter will be inserted to drain the bladder of wee for the first few days after surgery. On day four, any remaining tubes and bits of scaffolding used during surgery will be removed and you will be home by day 10. After surgery, it is important to keep hydrated by drinking two litres of water a day and take your medicines. Other than grapefruit, which interferes with the medicines that you will take, there are no foods which you cannot enjoy. So eat lots of good, wholesome, healthy food. Whilst it is probably best to avoid high contact sports, pretty much anything else goes and you can live a full, fun and active life after transplant. Typically a kidney transplant lasts 10 to 15 years. But the has been stories for lasting up to 40 years. This video has been made possible by the Allport community. Thanks for that. Um, what a great representation of transplants, well suited for all ages. 
Right, now let's introduce our patient panellists. Steve Fry is one of the founding members of Allport UK who participated in the very first Allport meeting in London in 2012 and supported Allport UK creating a website. Karen Knee managed to get Allport syndrome fe featured in the Barnsley local press when she received a kidney from an altruistic donor in 2016. Abby Lucy is a busy teacher during the day, so we are very grateful that she has kindly agreed to continue into the evening on Zoom to join us. Paul Matthews is an inspiration to us all as he has recently celebrated 37 years of employment with Tesco, who have supported him through his journey with Allport Syndrome. Finally, welcome to Joseph McLean, who has, was diagnosed with Allport Syndrome three years ago and received a kidney from his dad. Today, we are very privileged to have not one, not two, but three kidney doctors to help us moderate the discussion. Amrit Court is a children's doctor at the University of Manchester. Neil Turner is an adult kidney doctor at the University of Edinburgh. And Rachel Lennon is a researcher and children's kidney doctor at the University of Manchester. Adam and our three kidney doctors will all help me put your questions to our patients to understand what it's like to have a kidney transplant. Archie Walker and Harriet Carter will run the production of this webinar today, so do message them using the chat function if you have any issues. If you're new here, we have a few instructions to help you get the most out of the workshop today. Just so you're aware, all participants today are on mute and can't be viewed by any panellists or other viewers. When you want to ask a question, please use the Q&A function. Just move your mouse to the bottom of the screen to the toolbar and click on the Q&A icon. In that panel, you can ask questions, but you can also wish to be anonymous if you click on the anonymous button. We'll try and get through as many questions today as we can. The moderators and I will monitor those questions throughout the session to ask to our panelists. As always, as a little test, we'd love to see where you're all from. So you've got a little time now just to type in the chat window where you're watching from today. To share your mass message in the chat function with everyone who's attending, please make sure you select send to all panelists and attendees above the chat. That'll mean that everyone can see it, not just the panelists. Hi. Hi, Patrick. Oh, California. Coming in from everywhere. Make sure if you have any difficulties today with any of the features, hit us up using the chat function and Archie or Harriet will be on the case. Right, now that's over, before we hear from the patients, let's have a quick update from Amrit about the current situation with transplants and COVID. It would be helpful to understand the situation with the UK National Register, paired exchange programmes and things like this. A number of our patients are close to needing a transplant and it would be helpful to hear about the current situation across the UK. Those listening from outside the UK may need a local update. Over to you, Amrit. Oh, thank you very much, Aura, uh, for this question that's very topical at the moment. So my response to the question very much comes from a UK-based experience as well as pretty much paediatrics, although I've found out a little bit about added, um, adult transplants and what's happening there, but I'm sure Neil Turner can um, sort of pitch in afterwards. So you might be aware that when the pandemic hit last year, effectively all transplants stopped in the UK from about March till the summertime. Uh, there was only a handful of paediatric centres that remained opened, namely Belfast and Glasgow that I'm, that I'm aware of. And, and that seemed sensible because we have this new virus that we don't really know what was happening with it. And when you have a transplant, you're on medication, that means you're more prone to infection. So it was important to think about the safety, not only of the people receiving a transplant, but also of those people giving their kidneys. So everything was paused. And then as we started to learn a little bit more, come the summer, we just like flowers sort of opening up after a long winter, we started to reopen the transplant program. And again, as a doctor, that was really interesting because we had to effectively redesign the service in this whole new environment. And again, trying to keep everybody safe, 
patients, donors and staff. So that effectively meant you redesigned the service and concentrated on changing the consent form because we didn't really know what it would mean to have a kidney transplant whilst in the middle of a pandemic. We had to think about screening. How do we screen patients and their parents coming into hospital to make sure that they are negative and remain well? And also testing when they arrive for surgery to make sure that they don't have the virus and then advising on shielding afterwards so that they stay safe whilst they're on a lot of drugs to whilst the, their body adapts to the new kidney. So they were the sort of four main areas which we looked into making so in order to open up our transplant program. And I'm pleased to say from, from our perspective, we've been open since July from both sort of deceased donor and living donor. And Manchester has done 127 adult transplants so far and six pediatric transplants. Nationally, again, this email just came through. So it's very topical for me to be able to give you this information. So from January 2020 to January 2021, in the UK, it's my understanding that we've had 3,684 3, transplants, of which 193 people had COVID, were tested positive for COVID after surgery. And unfortunately, out of those 193, 24 died. So in terms of looking at the 24 that died, that equals 0.7% of everybody that had a transplant. So 24 sounds, you know, obviously any, any death is significant, but if in terms of how many have been transplanted, the, the, the complication of COVID is very less and anybody under 30 years of age that has been transplanted has remained well. So what that means is that now that we're in the second lockdown, the second or third wave, you know, you kind of lose track after a while, most centers have remained open and carried on transplanting. Definitely from a deceased donor perspective, those, the national waiting list is up and running. However, since most people in hospital have COVID, the offer of kidneys is likely to be less because we're not taking kidneys from COVID patients. And in terms of living donor, that again is, is still open for business. But again, hospital beds are limited. The idea is to continue until there really is no more space in the system. Uh, as you, you're probably all aware that the National Paired Scheme has been suspended and, and it won't run in April. And that's more to do with logistic reasons, moving people across the country. So I am really pleased to say that the transplant programme is st still up and running, uh, which is excellent news for anyone waiting for a kidney. However, you all know that in order to get a kidney, and especially from the video that we've just watched, it's not a case of sort of um, booking in for the transplant. There are a lot of investigations, tests, scans that have to happen. And all of that means navigating the NHS, which, and that's really where the, we see the delays are effectively, because the radiology department, for example, doesn't have the same amount of slots. The surgeons don't have the same amount of time to operate. So yes, there's no delay to having a kidney transplant, but getting to that point when you're on the finish, it's the start line has definitely been delayed. Great, glad to hear it. Um, Neil, is there anything you wanted to chip in? Uh, Amrit, thanks, because that gives a really um, useful update on, on numbers for everybody. And also, you know, you touched on the, the really serious thing which um, frightens all of us, which is, sure, transplant gets people much healthier. Um, and in, the, in adult practice, we know that being on dialysis, it's, well, at least hospital-based dialysis is really quite risky. It's really hard to avoid people if you're on that. And so the risk of getting COVID there is, is quite high. So not transplanting people is also a real worry. Um, we've made some really important adaptations in, in, res in response to this. Um, we're testing everybody when they move, essentially. If you, if you come near the hospital, if you... Um, if you're about to have a transplant, if, you're, um, if you've been in hospital for three days and we're trying to keep the number of um, people you see when you're in for your transplant right down. So you won't, I'm afraid you won't see any medical students, not face to face in, 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 uh, in our centre anyway. And I think the other um, really striking thing is the way we've made some adaptations to try and get patients out of hospital faster. So we are not accepting um, organs where there's a high chance of it not being really, really, it's highly likely to not work for quite a long time. 
So we are turning down some donors that we might normally accept and that's tough. Leads to some very active discussions between us and the surgeons sometimes. Do you know the surgeons, Amrit, are even more risk averse than we are? <laughs> um, and um, just, just listening to the presentation at the beginning where um, we, were, we were promised we'd be out by 10 days. Our patients are going out on day four. We've halved the length of stay for a lot of, a lot of patients. And um, do you know, it's, we should have done it ages ago. It's really working well. Um, it, it's quite hard to do. And, um, and, and again, if people have um, other illnesses that makes it very unlikely they'll get out of hospital quickly, we have to think twice about doing it because hanging around in hospital is not ideal. <laughs> Um, it's not ideal, um, particularly when you can't meet your family and so on, but it's just not ideal because there is COVID in hospitals. We know that and we do everything we can to prevent infection. But as Amrit was saying, um, the probably most um, adult units have had patients with um, not only on dialysis, but also with transplants who've run into trouble. And some of them um, have caught COVID in hospital. So we're absolutely obsessional about preventing that from happening. Um, there um, are some adult centres that are closed. So if you're at a centre that's open, actually the chances of getting a kidney offer at the moment are good. We've been quite busy, um, quite busy, but because we're keeping in people in hospital for such a short time, it doesn't always feel like it. The number of beds occupied are, are less. Um, so we're all hoping that this is going to get a little bit easier and, and, and better and that'll enable us to um, relax and get more organ donors through. But um, I think it's, it, it's actually gone much better than we feared given having to close everything the first time round. We've been able to keep going. It seems to be going well and the risks to people of getting um, COVID complications and, and now seem to be low with all the things which we're, we're doing. Thanks. Thanks, Neil. Um, next, each of our five patient panellists will take a couple of minutes to introduce themselves. So take us away, Steve. Hi there. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Steve. I am from Cambridge, uh, but currently shielding with my parents in Bow, who I believe may be on the call. Um, I work in the games industry. Uh, I was diagnosed with all ports uh, as a toddler um, and uh, kind of lived my, my young years not really realizing that it, it guaranteed kidney failure and so uh, by the time I was in my early 30s and had a child it had completely fallen off my radar and um, I went to see a close friend of Allport UK uh, Professor Francis Flinter who I think I've seen in chat um, who uh, just to basically um, help discuss uh, my daughter and what it might mean for her carrying all ports um, and it was at that time that um, she made the conversation more focused on myself and I think without saying directly told me that I looked kind of rubbish. Um, so the very next day uh, I had a blood test and within 72 hours I was on dialysis. Um, so the blood test revealed that I had 6% kidney function um, at the time uh, that I was tested. Um, and yeah, it was all very sudden and very unexpected um, and well, quite shocking and upsetting to try to get through. Um, I was lucky to have a really good network of friends and family uh, who cared for me and looked after me and the medical staff were absolutely fantastic. Um, and a good friend of mine um, became a live donor for me. So I was on dialysis for seven months. Um, and then in 2012, uh, received my uh, kidney transplant, uh, which was, yeah, I'm heading towards year nine now. Um, and it's, it's going strong. Um, for myself, uh, kind of dealing with the, the the fear of rejection, first of all, and also then kind of the, the kidney life itself, um, I struggled with that. And at the time, um, the, the services were all geared to dealing with the physical health. So it was really easy to get advice on staying healthy, but um, the mental health side of things, you had to kind of seek out a bit more but I think that's that's improved now but for me uh, meeting um, the people who have now become the Allport UK network was a massive help because that helped me um, get to grips with 
what I'd missed growing up with uh, with all ports but um, also I met people that had transplants for many years doing the London Bridges walk and uh, taking part in the transplant games for the last five years um, means I've met people from all over the country and all over the world who have had tr kidney transplants for 30 40 years which is incredible and and how I really came to terms with that fear of uh, of kidney failure and and rejection um so yeah i think for myself my main tip is become your own expert and seek help from people that know what you're going through um because that's that's how i got to where i am today and um happy and confident and comfortable with my kidney great thanks for that steve um no worries. so i'm glad that mark hewitt's just joined us uh he participated in allport uk's first edinburgh information day with his inspiring story of being a busy farmer in Lancashire, receiving a transplant from his brother. So if, Mark, if you wanted to take it away. Hello everybody. Um, yes, uh, my name's Mark Hewitt. Um, I'm a dairy farmer in Lancaster. Um, I'm 48 years of age. I've got the um, X-linked Oport syndrome. Um, my family, my mum and dad always knew that something wasn't right because um, I had signs of blood in my urine when I was five, but it wasn't until I was 16 till I um, had a biopsy done at Manchester. And then uh, they sent the blood away to um, America and came back that it was all ports. And um, it all started from there. It starts with me. I am the, um, it's not, it, I know it's hereditary, very hereditary, hereditary, but it starts with me in, in this family. So, um, so yeah, so basically I, I was told by the consultants at 16 that um, between 18 and 24, my kidneys will stop working and I will need hemodialysis. That was quite a shock at the time. Um, but um, I had the farm to keep me going. Um, a lot of hospital appointments, special diets, and then yes, hemodialysis came at 19. Um, I... Um, it was Witherton Hospital. I travelled down there three times a week for six months. They trained me there and I came back to my farm. Uh, we had a room in the farmhouse um, where I dialysed three times a week. I dialysed at night, 10 till six in the morning. Uh, that gave me all my days free. It was actually hemodialysis. Um, they recommended CAPD at the time, but when you've been a farmer, lived in bales of straw, that kind of thing. He thought it wasn't a good idea, so we, we had the hemo. So I do have a, a fist there on my arm, and as we speak now, it's still working. Um, so yeah, so I was um, on hemodialysis from 19 till um, 35 years of age. And um, it was March 2008. Um, my brother came, just my mum and dad, my mum and my um, brother came around one evening, it was on summer's night, and um, I, I, I thought someone died or something. Said, "Can we have a chat with you?" I said, "Yeah, that's fine." That uh, so we're in the house, and then um, that's when they like, dropped the bombshell. Really, that they've been to have some tests done, and um, my brother was a, a, a perfect match, and that he wanted to donate me a kidney. And I, I can't say how I felt. It was just a very emotional time. Um, you know, it's. Um, I don't get me wrong on dialysis. I mean, some people find dialysis hard, but to me, it. I managed it fine. You know, I had 15 years on dialysis. Um, but yeah, the transplant. So yeah, so my brother came forward and um, I, I didn't really know what to say really, but my mum said, well, let's go and have some consultations with the consultants. And so that happened. Um, and the um, the test, yeah, they just, just checked my brother out 100% and everything. And the, the transplant was scheduled for, it was actually February, March the 8th, 2007. Um, I mean, my brother got went down there with my mum, um, but it was red alert with flu at the time. So they, they said, can you come back next month? My mum was a bit upset. But anyway, me and my brother just thought, yeah, let's get back to the farm. So anyway, the following month, we went back down there again, March the 8th, um, 2007. And that's when um, we got down there at night time and um, it would be, we had separate wards and we had to sign some consent forms. And they said that we'd take my brother down at half seven the next morning. Um, and that I'll probably go down about 12 o'clock. And um, so, yeah, um, they came to get me, to take me down to theatre. 
and that's when I actually passed my brother on the corridor. He was coming back to his ward, and I was like going down to theatre, and um, <clears throat> I'll never forget that. Um, so yeah, so the, the operation, it, it took a bit long. It was a straightforward operation, but when I came round, I was in pain and um, a, a little blood vessel had burst, so they put me to sleep again. To cut long story short, I was back on the ward about nine o'clock, and I just remember waking up and uh, the clock just seemed so clear. My eyesight just, just seemed so clear. Um, but the kidney was working straight away. It was working straight away. So um, the next morning, um, they did um, a blood sample, a blood test, and um, my, is it, my creatinine was a 140. The day before that, it was about 1100. And then the following day, it came down to 70. So my brother then came to see us. Cut long story short, my brother was out after three days. He had small keel surgery. Um, my brother's six years younger than me. And um, he had his keel surgery. <laughs> He was he was milking back the, he was milking the cows and then a couple of days of coming home, uh, but to me I, I just woke up and I, I just I just I felt really good. Um, so yeah, so I, I was in there a week and um, mm -hmm. they discharged me, and then I was back down to Manchester um, three times a week for regular blood tests, and that went down to twice and then once a week. But the medication put me on then it was thirteen years ago um, hasn't changed now. It's still still the same, and um, yeah, I mean, I'm working. I still work alongside my brother, like I, I was on dialysis. Um, but I mean, you can't you can't put price on that gift, can you? Like, you know, it was it was just out of the blue. It was just it was a surprise, you know. And my mum had had some tests done as well, and um, my mum was a three out of six match. And, um, but um, my brother was a perfect match at the time, so. But my sister actually came forward, had some tests done as well, and, and my sister turned out to be a, a perfect match. So, um, but no, I, I never, never asked a question. I ne never, um, you know, when you get put on the transplant waiting list, the phone goes, you think, is that, that it? But, but, um, but no, but it did pop up once actually after maybe seven years on dialysis. Um, when I was on dialysis, um, I actually met my wife at 27 years of age. And um, cut long story short, Within three years, we'd married and, and had two boys, 10 months between them. And there was one night, a phone call came through of me consultant saying he got a full match, six out of six, but I had a very bad chest infection at the time, so that couldn't go ahead. Um, so obviously, so I had the transplant when I was 35. I'm now 48. And since the transplant, we've had two girls, Gina and Jodie. So I've got four children, two boys, um, 18 and 19 and I've got two girls now nine and 12 so um but yeah so it's um it's I do know um the uh, from my girl's point of view they're being monitored um we was told at the time with genetic counseling that you know the ladies only get like a mild symptom later on in life but um it can be different the x-linked so they're being, they're being monitored yes they've got a slight protein in the water uh, is it blood or blood? Sorry, oh. just just blood, and um, they're being monitored. So um, yeah, so but going back to um, you know, like I say, being diagnosed with it to dialysis to transplant. A bit about the transplant itself. Yeah, like Steve said, you, you can worry a bit of it at the start, you know. And um, I, I was always that when I went to get my bloods. Or what, what are they? Cause I worry a bit, but to be honest oh. with you. They've stabilised, you know, they've been, they've been the same all the time now, you see, and I just, um, I just go down to Preston once every six months for blood tests, and I've got my quality of life back, you know, it's, um, I have, uh, so yeah, anyway, I don't want to go on too much and bore you all, but I just thought I'd introduce myself, all right, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, Karen, if you wanted to give yourself a quick introduction. Hi, I'm Karen Canney. Um, I'm originally from Nottingham, uh, but I've lived eight years in Barnsley, which is when I had my transplant at the Sheffield Hospital, and now I'm on the east coast of Yorkshire. Um, I was first tested for all ports when I was five years old, um, but didn't actually find out the results of those tests until I was 21. There was a bit of an issue with the GP records. 
Um, so at 24, I developed pancreatitis and that sped on the uh, kidney failure. Um, so I lived with a GFR of about 18 for 18 years. And then all of a sudden, very stressful period in my life, my kidneys collapsed and I went on to dialysis for two and a half years. Um, I was on dialysis one day when I got a phone call from the transplant coordinator to say that they'd found me a donor and it was an altruistic donor. Um, I've never met the lady. Um, I know her name because we exchanged cards uh, at the transplant anniversary and Christmas. Um, but she'd just come forward to donate to the list and it just happened to match me. Um, so I was transplanted in 2016 after being on dialysis for two and a half years. Um, in terms of the transplant, I didn't really worry about the operation at all because I knew the surgeon. I'd had appointments with him uh, in the clinic and I, tr I trusted him. Um, my main worries around it were around uh, the altruistic donor changing her mind and not giving the kidney. So on the day of the transplant, it was due to arrive around one o'clock. So I didn't let myself get excited at all until I knew that it was in the hospital and uh, the operation was going ahead. And then obviously you've got the fears around rejection and the kidney are not working at all. So when I woke up from the operation, the first thing I shouted at the nurse was, um, is it working? And uh, it had not worked when they first put it in. Um, so the scan um, radiographer came down, um, but it suddenly started working. So uh, that, that worry went out of my head. Uh, in terms of um, support for the transplantation, I was uh, transplanted at a time when around eight people were transplanted. There was two, other, two um, others on my day, and then there was various ones within the week. So when we were going to the hospital for the appointments, we, we have to go three times a week at first. We all sat together, we all supported each other, you know, discussed our test results, things like that. And it passed a lot of time having a group around you really, because we were there for kind of five hours waiting for our test results. Um, so I would, I would really, you know, say to people to get involved with other people that have had transplants at the same time. Uh, the transplant coordinator will, will come out and see you and things like that, but they're just there really for, you know, advice on drugs, et cetera. Um, yep, and that's about it, really. 2016, I had it and I'm still doing OK. I've been left with, you know, renal bone disease and things like that and various bloods that aren't perfect. But I'm now off dialysis um, and that's really the best thing that a transplant does. It just gets your life back. Great, thank you, Karen. Um, Abby, if you wanted to unmute. Yes. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Abby. Um, I am 28. I'm um, not far from Karen. I'm in West Yorkshire um, in Halifax. Um, I had my transplant in May 2018. Um, I actually didn't find out about kidney. I had that I had kidney disease until I was 17. Um, and I randomly went to the doctors um, for an MOT because I'd not been to the doctors for years and they found that my blood pressure was really, really high. Um, and as a result was then transferred to see a cardiologist who then found out that I had issues with my kidneys. Um, I was under that consultant for eight years, um, at which point I then started to develop, um, I started to go into kidney failure. I was loosely diagnosed with a different condition. So I was actually diagnosed with FSGS, which is for, ooh, I can't pronounce it quite right, focal, focal segmental glomosclerosis. Have I pronounced that right? Yay. Um, and was diagnosed with that loosely um, because they could never sort of pinpoint what I had. Um, I didn't find out that I had all parts until just before my transplant about four years ago. Um, just just because the consultant that I was then referred to in Leeds um, questioned my diagnosis and wanted um, me to have a genetic test. Um, it was then discovered that I had all pots, um, but I was the only one like Mark in my family with all pots um, and uh, everyone else within the family was tested. They don't have it. Um, so it was just a mutation of the gene. Um, and transplant life is great very similar to Karen it's it's turned life around for me I've got I've got energy again um I didn't mind dialysis it was okay but um I found I could only do work one two days a week I am a teacher um three days a week I'm a special needs high school teacher which is quite physically demanding I find at times but I also now run 
um, a self-employed business um, that came out as a result of my transplant. I was really bored during recovery um, and I recovered very, very quickly. I recovered in about three weeks um, and um, I play games at home. I needed a tray to roll dice into to stop them falling on the floor. Made one myself. Friends liked it. Friends wanted it. And then everybody else wanted one and it snowballed ever since. Um, so yeah, I've got a nice work. I've got a nice balance of teaching three days a week, um, virtually. <laughs> Not being in school since March last year, which is a bit, ew, but anyway. Um, and then have run the business for nearly three years since my transplant. Um, my main thing for advice, I found what kept me going was keeping myself busy. Uh, that sounds really silly to say keep yourself busy, but it's just about keeping your brain busy. Even if it's just reading a book, doing a puzzle, um, whatever, watching it, just keeping yourself busy, I, f I found really helped. I'm a big crafter, so I found just sitting at the toy machine really helped, doing a bit of painting, even a paint by numbers, just keeping myself busy to try and stop my mental health deteriorating, I think was what I found, especially whilst I was on dialysis and post-transplant. I just found it really helped keep me occupied. Um, one of my fears, very similar to other people, was about rejection. I actually did go into rejection mode. My body re started to reject my kidney um, two days after the transplant. It's quite common, apparently. Um, but the doctors intervened straight away. They were fantastic. Um, and I was put on a quite high dose of what we call prednisolone, steroids. Um, and I've been on those ever since, but at a much minimum dose, along with some other medication to stop the rejection. Um, but yeah kidney's fine my dad was my live donor um and he was he was put forward along with my brother who were both perfect matches but my dad was a better match because my dad's my dad and I've got more in common with my dad than I do my brother that's how I look at it from a genetics and a whatever point of view um and yeah he's fine absolutely fine went back to work within two weeks <laughs> which is which was incredible <laughs> um so yeah yeah really positive experience and it's given me the transplant has given me my lease of life back and has allowed me to do so much more than I could have ever have imagined I've done glad to hear it thanks Abby uh Paul whilst we still have you would you like to give us a little intro yeah sorry about keep dropping off uh right hi uh, my name's Paul um I live in Ware in Hertfordshire um, I was first diagnosed back in 1969, 1970, when I was about four or five years of age. Um, reason being, my brother was having protein uh, urine in his blood. Um, so the wonderful doctors in Kent um, sent us up to Guy's Hospital to Professor Chandler and Francis Flinter. Um, and that's where we were um, basically diagnosed with all ports. Um, my brother then went on to have a transplant soon after. Um, from my dad. Um, I asked for the other one, but they wouldn't let me have it for some reason. Um, uh, I then went on to, uh, my kidneys started to fail over the next few years. And by the time I was uh, 11, um, I had both my kidneys taken out, went on to dialysis. I was on dialysis for four years, three to four years, and had my first transplant on Christmas Eve, 1980 which is really good because I got a whole load of presents from all sorts of people coming into the hospital as well as my family. Um, so not just the kidneys being a, a great present. Um, that lasted for five years, that kidney. Um, I had lots of rejection. Um, I went back onto dialysis. Um, uh, I then met my wife at work, um, who uh, by the time I was on dialysis again, kind of said, well, OK, I'm, we'll get, I proposed to her and we said that we'd get married, uh, but I said I wouldn't do it until I'd had a transplant, thinking I'd get a few years, um, you know, grace of a long engagement. Unfortunately, uh, five months around the corner, I got a transplant. Um, so it happened a bit quicker than I hoped. Um, so, yeah, my second transplant then lasted 14 years. Um, I had two great kids from that. Um, and then, I think, unfortunately, that went as well. Um, back on dialysis again. Um, uh, that time a little bit longer, that's time uh, for about 11 years. And then my third transplant came along and that was in September 2014. 
Um, so that's six years ago now and everything's ticking over, going really well. Um, I'd say probably the backbone um, of my life really has been my work. I've been in full-time employment since I was 18 uh, with one company and I've got to plug them, it's Tesco stores. Um, so yeah, you know where to get your shopping now if you want to help me. Um, I've been there 37 years now. Um, uh, they have basically been the backbone for me. They've supported me through, you know, two, two failed transplants, 23 years on dialysis. Uh, they've been really good. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think <clears throat> you need something else to focus on. Um, and work's been my focus and family, of course, um, and Tottenham Hotspur, but um, that's another story. Um, so uh, probably thinking back after my second transplant, uh, what would I tell my 15 year old self um, before my 15, uh, uh, my first transplant, I would say is that talk to a lot of people, ask as many questions as you can, uh, know your results, know your bloods, um, know what's happening to you, know your own body. Um, yeah, you know what's happening to you before the doctors do, I think sometimes. Um, and, and you can, you can, you know, head things off quicker sometimes. Um, certainly with, you know, water infections and things like that, you know, you know, better than your GP does. Um, and, and just know your results, know what you're talking about and know the detail. So that's my, that's my two tips is uh, have something to focus on um, other than kidney world and, um, and, and know your own body and your own results and ask a lot of questions as you can. That's me. Great, thank you, Paul. Um, finally, we have Joseph. Hi, I'm, I'm Joseph. I'm from Dolphinton in Scotland. Uh, I was uh, diagnosed, well, initially diagnosed with kidney failure. It was a bit of a, a shock for me. Uh, it was in the summer of 2018, and I've been feeling quite unwell for about six months, so just sort of plowing on with it, tried to get on with things. And then I went and got um, my blood tested um, after a particularly bad day. Uh, and then found out well, later on that day that uh, my kidneys had failed. And then uh, it did take quite a few months, maybe three or four months afterwards for them to do the sort of um, genetic testing. Uh, and then to find out that I had Alports, uh, which was actually a bit of a relief for me that it wasn't something that I'd done to my own kidneys <laughs> to cause them to fail. Um, so from that diagnosis, I, was, I went back to uni and I was on dialysis for about seven, seven months, I think, uh, before I managed to get a transplant from my dad in February of 2019. Uh, and I think uh, a tip that I would give is, uh, is similar to what everyone else has said, is not to underestimate the, the mental side of things. I think my body... Uh, reacted really well physically to the transplant. I recovered really quickly. I didn't really have too many complications during the transplant. I didn't feel pain, maybe just discomfort uh, at times. Um, but the mental side is, is, was uh, quite difficult uh, for me with the fear of rejection, um, along with other things. And uh, my tip would be just to, to seek professional help if you really, really, uh, or if, you, if you feel that you need it at all. I'm not to be afraid or ashamed of it because you, you really need a professional to help you through some of those times, I think. Great, thanks, Joseph. Um, so now Adam and I are gonna ask a couple of questions to our panelists. Please can you all use the Q&A function to ask any questions you might have, big or small, to our panelists. So my first question's for Paul, whilst he's still here. Um, so I was gonna ask you, I know you've had three transplants now. Um, when you were younger, obviously the fear of rejection the fear of a transplant in itself was probably quite great being so young but sort of I wanted to know whether or not it gets any easier have you got any advice if people are having more than one transplant oh does it get easier um <laughs> don't think it gets easier um you know what you know what's to come um that might be maybe a little bit more daunting maybe um but you do know what's to come and what to expect um and obviously by then you you know a lot of people in the hospital you know who to talk to uh who's going to help you through it um there's plenty of nurses and that i've um i've met and and i still know now 
uh, from my first transplant and when I was first on dialysis. And um, one in particular that I will still ask for advice, even now. And I'm 54 and, you know, she took me down for my first dialysis session down in guys. Our mental capacity to sort of go out and investigate. Um, I was referred to a genetic counsellor and went to see her who gave me some great factual information. But as I was undergoing transplant workup, didn't really focus on it, didn't really absorb it and fully take it in. It wasn't until after my transplant that I've started to fully investigate it and what that means as a woman. Um, because obviously there's a lot of complications about having children and passing it on and um it wasn't until I went back to my genetic counsellor only about six months ago eight months ago and started to really ask some really detailed questions about what was involved and it would obviously mean going down to guys to undergo some some things there which would be um there's a, a time element involved and obviously having that alongside having a transplant for me, for having children, it's it's quite a long, it could be quite a long and elongated process, which is fine. Um, but it was initially coming to terms with it and what that meant. I saw other professional help. I've had counselling about it just to, prop, um, with, a, with an external professional to talk, just talk about it. And I found talking about it has helped me so much, even if it's with friends that don't actually fully understand it, just talking about it and talking about it with, with, family as well is just so important because I feel I personally felt when I was first diagnosed that I was completely on my own I didn't know anybody with this I was like what on earth is this and it wasn't until like I said I went out and did research started talking to people talking to the professionals about it seeking professional advice that I started to fully comprehend what it meant um and I've just sort of taken it in my stride really don't, don't get me wrong I'm not I'm not there are my times when when we we all we all have a bit of a dip we all get a little bit overwhelmed by it and I'm, I'm I certainly do but um I find that the best way for me to overcome those moments is to is to is to keep busy keep my hands busy um so I find that working very similar to Paul help really really helps me I am very work driven because that's another focus for me to help overcome the the side of it that, that that feels quite daunting at times it does it does overwhelm me and feels quite daunting but I'm getting there with it yeah definitely I hope that answers your question great thank you Abby it just shows how important communication is and keeping busy so my last question before I pass to Adam is for Mark uh, I just wanted to ask you how your mum coped with both you and your brother going into hospital so I just wanted to know if you had any advice for people who want to support their family members or their friends, etc., who want to support as much as they can people who are undergoing a transplant. Mark, you just need to unmute yourself so we can hear you. No worries at all. Is that okay? Can you hear me now? Great, thanks. Great. Yes, no, going back to what Oris said then. Um, yes, I think um, from my mum's point of view, um, with it being like an X linked, it was all, it was a big shock for the family uh, when they found out. Obviously, I wasn't well. Um, and, you know, my mum and dad was behind us 100%, taking us through all my appointments. Um, and I think, yeah, the back of my mum's mind, it was a big burden, um, especially when my sister had to be tested before she had children. But that we, we found out in the end, I am the only one, you see, bloods were sent. In the, going back to when I was 16, I don't think the blood test, they had to send them away to America, you see. I don't think um, it took time. You couldn't do the test in this, in this country. So um, a lot of worry there on, from my parents' point of view. Um, but, um, but, yeah, I think... You know, when I got put on dialysis, uh, my mum was always there, always making sure I, I went on dialysis and everything's all right. And, um, you know, when I came off, she'd be there helping me, just checking everything was okay. 
when you look back now, it, it could have been a, it was quite a worry for them, like, you know. Um, but I think, um, yeah, when it comes to the transplant as well, um, like I said before, we got called up February, March the 8th, and we got down to Manchester. It was all planned to be happen the following day. And they, they called it off because it was red alert because of the flu, what was, down, what was out at the time. Um, so I could tell she, you know, she, I don't know, she was, me and Peter was like, well, just let's get back, let's get back to the farm, we'll come back next month sort of thing. But from my mum's point of view, it's quite a, I think there is a lot of pressures on families, you know. Uh, when, when you've got all puts when you're younger, I don't think you, you see that side when you're younger. I think you realise it more when you get older. Um, so, um, but yeah, if, if that helps. Great, thank you. <coughs> um, I'm just going to pass over to Adam if you have any questions. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I want to expand on something I think, you know, all of our patient panelists here have hit on to some degree, and that's sort of the the mental health aspects and the anxieties that come with, you know, both pre-transplant, dialysis, and post-transplant. And Steve, I, I think you mentioned this specifically. You felt that, you know, when it comes to or the physical health, all the resources were there for you. You know, it would, you know, all the information that you needed was there. But on the mental health side, you know, you had to be a little bit more proactive about it and seek things out. So I'm just curious, you know, what worked for you? You know, who did you reach out to? Who did you talk to? What are some of the tips that you can provide? You know, all of our, our patients are going to be going through this. Yeah, sure thing. I think for me, um, I probably took a bit longer than I should have to to ask for help, uh, and it, I didn't really um, realize how much easier it made life so I, I was very kind of introverted as a human being always so I dealt with problems internally and then figured it out and then went on with life and, and did that but for me um, it was very much finding a group of people who had experienced what I was going through um, and discussing their experiences both both good and bad you know the, the doctors are very good at giving you the facts this uh, and the percentages of things that could happen things that could be well things that could go wrong and and it's all very black and white and they give you all the information you need but it doesn't translate into real human experience uh, because none of us are average um so coming to to the first airport workshop and talking to people who who had been there people like paul who has had three kidneys um over over many years versus my dialysis nurse who'd had a single kidney for 35 years and the differing experiences there it's it was it was actually getting some context for what life with a transplant is like that allowed me to put my own life into perspective and i think um realizing that that not just talking to people that have been through it but then finding the, the 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 strength to actually speak to somebody that does it professionally that can help you unpack your own thoughts in a way that your friends would never feel that they can talk to you in, in that way where they it's their job to to help you understand yourself and you know a professional that that can really dig into the depths of your anxieties that you haven't quite worked out yet that that was it was incredibly uh, uplifting and um helped me sleep at night a great deal yeah, thanks for sharing that, Steve. No worries. Uh, Joseph, I want to turn to you. I think, you know, you experienced something that a lot of people, you know, in our community experience, and that is, you know, having end-stage adrenal disease, dialysis and transplant while also being in school at a university. Now, how, how did you handle that? How did you juggle the two? Uh, I, I think I was, I was quite lucky that when I went uh, back to university in Aberdeen, the, the hospital Aberdeen had the twilight sessions. So they, they would start around five o'clock and I was on dialysis for about four, four and a half hours each time. So I'd finish around about nine. So I mean, I could get back home, uh, have my dinner, head back to sleep. And then the next day I could head back to uni. So it did actually work out uh, quite well to be able to, to find that. But I'm not sure if every um, uh, dialysis uh, area has the exact same thing. I think I was just quite lucky that Aberdeen did uh, and I was able to study while I was on uh, dialysis, which is like, I, I don't think I would have done um, <laughs> without, the, without the dialysis itself. So quite lucky in that regard. 
Uh, and lastly, Karen, I want to turn to you. Uh, so I think you mentioned you were on dialysis for about two and a half years before your first transplant. You know, what did you do during that time to keep yourself, you know, both mentally and physically prepared for, you know, the day that eventually did come when you got a call and said, hey, you know, we found a match for you. And you come to the hospital right now. To be honest, I expected it to be the phone call overnight, um, but it wasn't. It was, I got the phone call um, two weeks before I had my uh, transplant, but I've got a dog um, and he was the reason that I got up in the morning, you know, and I'd walk him and things like that. I think um, if I hadn't had him, it would have been a different story. You know, he kind of forced me out of bed in the morning. Um, I'd got to look after him as well as, you know, myself. So yeah, that was the way that I did it. I think looking back now, I perhaps would have, um, got more help, you know, uh, mentally when you're not going outside of it a lot, because I, I struggled on dialysis, it, um, it does affect you mentally. Like we've all had with the COVID situation. Um, and I think I probably would have, you know, maybe got a mobility scooter or something like that. So I could have been outside a lot more. Um, but I spent a lot of time in my garden as well. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, or do we want to, you know, transition to some of the questions in the chat and the Q and A? Yeah, of course. Um, so somebody has asked, how long does the average transplant last? I think that's probably quite a common question. Rachel, did you want to answer that? Yeah, so I think we've um, we we heard that in the in the um, little video there at the beginning in terms of um, you know ten to fifteen years, but then there's quite a range, um, and I think that's one of the the difficulty difficulties we have in um, um, that early stage is is knowing what course an individual transplant is going to take and what hurdles might be along the way. Um, but, um, you know, I think 10 to 15 years is something to, to work on, but clearly it can go longer. And we've heard a range in terms of um, um, uh, the experiences on the panel tonight. I see there's a question for you, Neil, regarding does hearing get better post transplant? Yeah, actually, I clicked on the wrong question when I said I'd answer that live. <laughs> but still, it was still, it's a it's a good one. Um, do, can I, I'd just like to add on to what Ra Rachel said. You know, ten to fifteen years. Every every year when you ask this question and I go to look it up, it's a little bit better. So transplantation has been gradually, gradually, gradually getting better and better every year. Um, if you are lucky enough to get a young, healthy donor, Karen, it sounds as if you probably did, even though it wasn't a, a, a living family member, for instance, then, then actually the, the statistics are much better than that. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a, and there's a bit of luck in, in the draw as well. So, you know, you can get a, you can get a kidney out of the blue from a, a deceased donor, and there are people around who've had those in for 40 years, and they're just, it's just amazing. Um, one thing that um, transplantation, so far as we know, doesn't fix though, is hearing. Um, it doesn't seem to do anything for hearing, but the, the thing I would say there is that repeatedly in these sessions with Allport UK, we've come up with the, the problem that not nearly enough research has been done onto hear, into hearing in patients with Allport syndrome. And, and, and I loved, Mark, I loved your description of waking up after the transplant operation, you could see more clearly. <laughs> and I'm sure that people find the same with their hearing, but I'm not sure that if you actually measure, you can see much difference. Your brain works better, no question. Your brain works better with a transplant than it does on dialysis. So that's probably important too. Um, the, the question I thought I was tricking, clicking on was, does Alports come back after transport, after transplant? And it, and it doesn't, it doesn't come back. But there is this very rare complication that you may have read about of Alports anti-GBM disease, which I, I'm gonna first of all say, hardly anybody gets that nowadays. Modern immune, immune suppressive treatment seems to be very good at preventing it. So although it used to be said that it might occur in, I don't know, two in a hundred, Allport transplants. I haven't seen one in the last 10 years personally, and I think I've heard of one or two worldwide only. 
And, and this is when, um, if you have a bad Alport mutation, you have absolutely no Alport protein in your glomerular-based membrane, GBM, and then your immune system can see the protein in the donor kidney as, that it's never seen before. So it's like, you know, it's like a foreign, a, a bug getting in. It's like the flu virus getting in. Your immune system sees this thing it's never seen before and it attacks it. But modern immunosuppression seems to have almost completely wiped out that problem. So the other really good news is that everything you read about the average, you know, the average transplant, actually all port patients do better than the average transplant because they uh, tend to be fit, fitter and not have other conditions. And they're perhaps a little bit younger when they get transplanted, many of them. So um, it gets better every year, and Alport is actually better than the average transplant recipient. Thanks, Neil. Uh, another question that we got, uh, pass this on along to Amrit, uh, that is, what is the advice given for traveling post-transplant? And sort of specifically, you know, is it more dangerous to travel to countries that maybe are a little less developed and, and don't have as high quality healthcare systems? What sort of advice do you have for transplant patients? Uh, so at the moment, I don't think anyone's moving anywhere. So, and I don't think, I guess, um, travel is a big question mark. What we say in our centre is that, you know, the idea of having a kidney transplant, it's about getting your life back and doing all the lovely things that people have spoken about. So we say within the first year not to go abroad, just because you're coming into hospital a fair amount, having clinic visits, and understanding you know, your health with new medication and getting used to uh, having a new kidney and taking your, your medication. So we don't say no to travel abroad, but we would say, you know, make sure that you um, take precautions because effectively you're trying to reduce the risk of getting an infection when you're out there. So drinking bottled water, thinking about where you're eating, um, doing the necessary vaccinations before you go abroad, obviously no live vaccinations um, post transplant so we are very much supportive of families going out and you know living their life we look after quite a fair number of people that um, have families in India Pakistan Africa and we've supported families to go back and have those holidays Great, thank you. Um, I just had a question for Karen. Um, you told us that you received your kidney from an altruistic donor. I wondered if you could just give us a brief description of what this actually means and how like common it is. Um, yeah, um, my donor just came forward and wanted to donate. So I had all the tests, um, you know, counseling, everything like that, and then was put, um, tested against the list and mine was the best match for her and for me, obviously. Um, you, you don't meet, um, you don't know anything about the other person. Obviously, the, 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 their records are held on your records, but you don't see them. Um, and she wasn't in the same area or, or anything as me, so the, the transplant had to travel in. Um, you can meet after if you wanted to. Um, and we, we actually contact each other through the transplant unit rather than directly. Um, but it was pure chance that I was actually a match for her. It's, it, it, there's, there's no kind of link between me and her. She didn't come forward to actually donate to me. It's, it's not like, you know, people getting them from family members or whatever. Yeah, great, thanks. Um, Rachel, um, is sort of altruistic donors, are they, are they a lot more common or they, than people think, or is it very minimal numbers that we're seeing? I, that's there's certainly um, in in our center and our experience the um, the the lowest number um, of the you know different types of kidney donations that you can have, um, and um, and I would say probably um, in our experience over the last um, five years or so at the Children's Hospital Amrit, I'm sure will correct me if I'm wrong, but um, we've probably had a couple come forward and we are transplanting you know up to um, uh, you know, 25 um, uh, children per year. So it's it's certainly a minority. Great, thanks, Rachel. I think, Adam, you had a question? 
Yeah, Steve, I, I see you flagged a question uh, regarding what are tips uh, for family and friends supporting you post-transplant? Uh, help us out there. Yeah, um, the first thing uh, we've, we've spoken about the mental health aspect a lot is you'll only get as, as much support as you signal that you need. Um, so it's really easy just to say everything's great when a friend asks you um, how you're doing. So, I mean, it takes, I guess, a bit of honesty to allow yourself to be supported. But I think there's two sides to the question uh, as well, which is it's not just, um, you're not just kind of the, the main character in the story. We, we've spoken previously about um, your transplant being like a, a journey or a story, but every every person around you has their own version of that. So particularly with all ports, I'm sure there is, a massive amount of parental guilt um, that comes from thinking that you've you've given this to your child who's had to go through this. So really recognizing, and also once you've had the transplant, the people that are actually physically looking after you. So um, you know immediately afterwards, I had a six-month-old child and um, a, a, and a wife who had to do that and look after me at the same time. So I was getting all the attention and all of the help, and she wasn't. So realizing that, that, that people around you also require that support and helping them find that. So with, with Allport UK and the things that we've done, you know, my mom has managed to find other moms that have, have been in the same place and done the same thing. And, you know, um, partners meet other partners who have helped their help their loved one through transplant and 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 beyond. So really just that I think probably doesn't get spoken about enough how much outside you support is required as well for the people closest to you but yeah just be open and honest with your friends and really if you need if you want to talk about how you're doing just be honest with that and that's really the only way that your friends can support you properly and kind of in the same vein uh, I've been told Paul that you and your family love holidays can you elaborate on that and how holidays, uh, you know, help manage the stress for you? Um, it's just a thing to look forward to. Um, plenty of bad things going on all the time. So it's uh, it's something to put in the diary um, and to look forward to. Um, I was on dialysis, as I said earlier on, for quite a long time. And um, whatever we did, we made sure we went on holiday every year. Uh, I was in fortunate position that my dad lived in um, Florida. So uh, he checked out a few units out there for us and uh, we went and stayed out there quite a few times. Um, we decided I had another friend that had a place in Turkey. Um, so we went and he checked it out for me again out there and uh, we went and stayed out there for a, a, a couple of holidays. Um, my wife and I have been to uh, Italy and Spain and Portugal on dialysis. And we've also done a lot. Um, we also go to Italy a lot um, since the transplant. Um, so, yeah, it's just something to look forward to. So, um, other than the uh, drudgery of work, which uh, I do enjoy, but uh, you've got to have a break from it. And, um, yeah, something to look forward to. Thanks, Paul. Um, I just had a question for Joseph. Um, so, I wanted sort of how the experience overall was for you. Because everything, obviously everything happened quite quickly for you. You all of a sudden found out you, your kidney was failing, then you're in hospital. How was sort of the recovery process and the stay in hospital? How was how did that impact you? Um, well, so I think initially from from the the diagnosis to the transplant was a, it was a relatively short period of time, and I didn't really have a lot of time to to process all that was going on. I think I was so focused on just getting on with my life and trying not to let it affect me uh, in as big a way as possible that I didn't really think about much uh, to do with the transplant until it was kind of presented to me uh, that my dad was a match and then during during the transplant uh, I, I felt as if I it, it it was I had a relatively easy experience uh, in all honesty I mean I, I wasn't I think because of the amount of pain medication you end up on I didn't really feel under too much pain at all. I think it, I wouldn't describe. I wouldn't describe it as pain. It was maybe discomfort from time to time, uh, and it was more just wanting to get the hell out of the hospital. <laughs> that was the the biggest pain, uh, more than anything. Uh, but again, I recovered pretty quickly. I was back active um, on my bike about six, six weeks after the transplant. So um, yeah, I, I felt as if I had a quite quite an easy ride from the the transplant onwards. Uh, in all honesty. Great, thanks. Good to hear it.
I'd like to turn it over to Abby. Uh, I, you've mentioned, you know, several times about the importance of staying busy and how much that helped you. I'm curious, you know, what, what sort of conversations did you have with your employer, you know, around the time when, you know, you're experiencing dialysis and needed a transplant, you know, just sort of setting expectations, you know, your life is obviously going to change at that point, And there's going to be some days where, you know, you just can't work as much. You know, how did you approach that situation? So it was quite a confusing situation. Um, the, I, I've had several employers, but the first employer that I was with, I basically um, reduced my hours at work. So I went from working a five day week to working a two day week, which was quite a dramatic change, but it's what my body needed. And I sought um, occupational advice on that. And it's what they deemed was best for me at the time. However, I then made the decision to then leave because I decided to start, I needed to start dialysis and I wanted to do peritoneal dialysis and the needs of the children that I worked with, um, uh, a, lot of, a lot of children that I worked with specifically in the classes that I worked in were quite aggressive and like to pull on things specifically that area. Um, so made the decision to leave but had already lined up another job working in a children's museum part-time and they agreed to take me on whatever hours I wanted to do really so again went and did two days there and did my dialysis at work which was great um, and then decided to go back into teaching um, and applied for another job just before my transplant I don't know why I decided to do that but did um, and started there working one day a week four months after my transplant so it was a bit of a, a bit of a wave, but um, everyone that I've worked with has been really supportive. It's just about explaining the situation and being honest about what's going on. Um, and my current employer, I'm, I'm constantly updating them with what's going on and any changes that might have to happen or any appointments. They're really flexible with me because I currently only work three days for them. So um, it works in it works both ways really. It's just being open and honest about the communication and what's best for you and if you do have any my advice is if you do have any um, employers that are a little bit strict and stringent go through occupational health um, get a referral and seek their advice seek your consultant's advice on what's best to do if if, if ever you are un, not too sure Great, thank you, Abby. Yeah, it's really important to discuss these kind of things. So finally, it's essential that we finish our workshop with a word cloud. Have a look in the chat window for your link today. All you have to do is click the link, visit the site and submit one word that describes your feelings having watched the workshop today. That's one word to summarise how you're feeling after listening to the workshop today. amazing people in all that's how that's certainly how i'm feeling after listening to these guys great thank you everyone um, finally, I would like to say a personal thank you to our six patients. They have each had their own worries and found ways to overcome their fears, trusted the medical teams and come out with life-changing transplants. And especially that they're able to share their experience today with us all. It takes real courage and great optimism to be so positive. It's so inspiring to hear that they're all busy people leading exciting and fulfilling lives despite everything they've been through. It's truly inspiring to hear their stories. We thank them all as their we thank them all as their frankness and stories help all of us to address our own fears with a better understanding of what it's like to actually have a transplant. If anyone facing a transplant would like to talk further with someone who has had a transplant, please either call Allport UK on 01793 847 264. That's 01793 847 264 or email us info at allport.org. 
Thanks to everyone for coming today and please do let us know if you have any topics or research that you would like us to feature in any future workshops. Workshops this year will feature the latest research from Jai Ding's lab in Beijing, China, where they're doing exciting clinical work on genetics and kidney function. Laura Perrin's lab in Los Angeles on the west coast of the US, where the labs are working on stem cell therapy ideas. Momita Barua's lab in Toronto, Canada, where they are trying to improve diagnosis by looking at the relationship between FSGS and Allport syndrome. And finally, Alessandro Renieri's lab in Siena, Italy, who are working on genetics, gene therapy and COVID specific research. A huge thank you to our fantastic patient panel today, Steve, Mark, Abby, Karen, Paul and Joseph. Thank you also to our wonderful team of moderators, Amrit, Neil and Rachel. And finally, a big thank you to Adam from across the pond for joining me to host today. Thank you to each of you individually too for all that you do internationally on an ongoing basis for Allport Syndrome. We are so lucky to have you as part of our community. Finally, a massive thank you to Research Kidney Research UK for your sponsorship, helping fund our Zoom subscription and keeping the lights on for all these Allport workshops. This charity has supported us for years, right back to the first workshop we did in Oxford. They're the ones who are enabling us to get well-informed, reliable information to you wherever in the world you live. If you have any feedback about this session or want to be added to our mailing list, email research at allport.info. Archie will pay paste this in the group chat for you. Please also follow us on social media to hear updates about workshops as they happen and details about upcoming research and in-person workshops. Patients can join the Allport Warriors Facebook group and anyone can hit us up on the Twitter page. That's at Allport UK. A three question survey will appear in your browser when you leave today and we'd be extremely grateful if you could complete this for us. We will get a recording up of this talk on YouTube, on YouTube in a few days time. So if you missed something or want to look back over it, you'll be able to do so. Otherwise, thank you all so much for watching and have a lovely rest of the day or evening, wherever you are.